Hello, this is a chapter 21 and it's on artificial intelligence and uh, this is uh, not a chapter that I have done a lot of actual programming on but I have done uh, some research on and I've not done it in, in a factory but I have done a lot of uh, work with some of these uh, programming techniques so uh, when you hear in you're where you're working that they're going to go to Watson or they're going to use AI I uh, don't want you to shrink away and say well I don't know what that means because uh, most of it is some programming technique or some programming process that you probably can look up and figure out and uh, have a hand in, in uh, implementing so that's why this is an important chapter it's not a chapter that you're going to go right out and utilize in your work probably it may be because AI is continuing to become more popular with with uh, people as they as they look at a process but that being said uh, you may or may not be involved right away so this is something that its terms and how you start applying it and how you start looking at it is, is why this is important as a chapter and uh, it's not something that we're going to do any um, program that you would have as a turn-in program but there's a lot of things that you could use in this in this there is one program at the end that we we do talk about but uh, very rarely would you do anything like that in a, in a, in a manufacturing process so again um, I just wanted to introduce this, pro this process of talking about AI to you and uh, give you some ideas. At the end of this chapter we do talk about fuzzy logic and it is a topic that you might run into in a, some situations and some people may talk to you about fuzzy logic and there's ways around that. There may be something that may be some, somewhere that you actually want to implement. So again we're going to talk about these and just give you a little bit of a, of a foothold in some of these topics. Okay, so there is some uh, amount of learning inside of a program controller that you can do. And uh, in this case, we're trying to control the amount of flow out of this vessel. And when do you shut it off in order to make a wave and the scale? Well, obviously, if you have more pressure up here, there's going to be a more flow than there is if you have this lower amount right here but even more than that there's the idea of uh, the uh, viscosity of the liquids the viscosity can change that you want to have the program to actually learn what the, the weighment was from the time prior and adjust accordingly so this is something that you can you can adjust that switch off when you see how much you were off the last time and this would be called adjusting the preact and this is something that I've actually done before I've written a program that actually does that adjustment of that preact so the next time you weigh up on the scale you're more accurate and you want to find the the the, the best way of, of doing that and this is a, a an algorithm that you can write and um, We'll, we are not going to talk about any specific algorithms, but I think you see the idea that you can have learning going on in your program as you are progressing. Learning is something that you want to adjust things so that you're always hitting the best possible result. This is a case that you would do that in. Okay, so we are going to talk about statistics in this chapter. and. Um, one of them is regression and this is something that you have had a statistics course hopefully and you will recognize this as something that it's a it's a line but it's fitting of a line to the best possible outcome for all for all the variables that you have and uh, that's something that you can uh, acquire by looking at all the variables and you can say okay so we're gonna do all these variables uh, down the row we're gonna fit the best possible outcome that we can to it or 
we just have one but whatever the the case may be you can fit a um, a line to the best set of all the data based on what we call least squares and that's what that is okay so that's regression analysis now a more powerful tool for forecasting is called ARIMA A R I M A and this stands for autoregressive integrated moving average it's a tool for predicting future variables based on past occurrences and I ought to know about ARIMA because this was what we used in my PhD uh, dissertation to smooth the variables that were coming in that were pretty random oriented but if you pass them through an ARIMA algorithm they made more sense and they were more able to be used then as a statistical process to figure something out so this can be used a number of ways and one of the ways that it is used is in the stock market and uh, you can use Minitab to do ARIMA you can use other packages to do ARIMA but basically it is a process of finding a number of variables and uh, these variables depend on uh, the uh, the three the three variables depend on the uh, fit of the uh, model to those variables the uh, P is with re regret to uh, moving average the D is the number of differences and the Q is the lagging errors and the uh, P term is basically the proportional term the D term is basically the integral term and the Q term is not the D term in the sense of uh, you're looking at a derivative term but it is a term that is based on a wave in other words you have a, a an oscillatory value in this in this Q term is a way of predicting the oscillatory value that it, that it changes based on some oscillation so these are the three variables that you you, you use and uh, I'm not going to go into it in any great de detail other than to say that your job if you write one of these is to find these these um, these variables these um, terms here that are uh, these constants and you use the whole data set to find the best fit of these constants and then you also use the the, the various data sets to find uh, if you have a value of of uh, how many looking back instances you have and this is the uh, values that you would use for the the, the one the two the three the four so if it was one it would be one variable looking back if it was two it would be two instances looking back and these are uh, these are defined and you can actually um, take a data set and find the AR of one uh, the AR of one the AR of one comma one you can find those and you can find which fits better which has the least error over the whole data set and that's the one you want to use so you want to find the one that has the best possible fit over the entire data set and you do that and it will give you a a smoothed version of your data in other words it will give you a predictive data set for your data that you can either use to predict or then you can use it to to give you a uh, a tool that then you can compare data with you can use the smoothed data to find a, a model of your process and that's what I did I used it to find a model of my process and uh, that it works very 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 well and there are books on this to give you some methodologies for finding these variables and you can also use Minitab to find a fit of these variables you can also use um, other statistical uh, packages to do the same uh, my advisor used SAS SAS to do that 
So it's something that you can use for predicting. It is not AI, but it is a modeling process and you can use it to do a bunch of things and you can use it to predict the stock market, you can use it to predict variables, you can use it to smooth things out so that things become more understandable. And that's what people in the stock market do, but they're very good at it and they use a lot of variables. Okay. Okay, so relational artificial intelligence can be viewed as a problem that seems to be more easily solved by humans than by computers. AI refers to those techniques that solve these problems through logic, probability, and other methods. The question of whether it refers more to science and engineering may also be raised. In fact, it may be viewed as both. These symptoms may think like a human. They also may be described as systems that act rationally or even may think. Most applications do not require the program to think, but only to behave rationally. So we go through here and we ask some questions. And if you wonder where I got most of this, I got most of this from a uh, book that I quote in the front of the what, where it came from, but again, I, I, I give credit for it. But this is kind of an overview of a first from now on in this. It's kind of an overview of a first course in AI that you would see in a college campus. The first part of it, not not the, the last part of it, but just the introductory first third of a course in AI, an introductory course. Okay, so we talk a little bit about ethics. And uh, I think that you ought to read through these and uh, decide how much you're willing to give up as far as your individuality when you do look at AI. And um, so can I use an AI program to, to play a game such as ping pong? Well, of course you can. Can I use an AI program to navigate, uh, navigate a car along a twisting mountain road? I don't know. Doubt if I would. Can I program AI to buy the, the week's worth of groceries at the local Kroger store? Probably would. Today, probably would. But I would always want to look at it again over the over the course of after the list is made. I'd always want to look another, give it another look, see to see if I found anything wrong with it. Um, would you want to have an AI program to perform delicate surgery on your body? No, I wouldn't. Translate a copy of a foreign language to English. Yes, I would. Today, I would. Okay. Now, a language processing includes the easy translation, such as 2 plus 2 equals 4. Or it can program the more difficult, like we would say something like jump the shark. What does that mean? It only means something to people who have a background in that arena. In other words, if you were alive and watching Happy Days back in the 1980s, you would have maybe seen the episode that led to the 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 uh, the, the, uh, the term jump the shark because this was where it went too far. In other words, there was a, a statement that they just went too far. And I didn't see that show, but I can if I can tell you that when if that would have if I would have seen it, I would have said, yep, that was just too much. So if you say jump the shark, what your meaning is, they went too far. But only people who had seen that event would have known or have heard about it would know what that meant. They would not have a clue as to what jump the shark meant unless they had some prior knowledge. So prior knowledge was the, the effect of why jump the shark means something to people. Okay. Do not forget the use of AI in games such as playing of chess. Very good for playing chess. Okay, now here's a problem. And it can be stated, and then we basically can move on. But basically, if you have walls that can be put up in various places, how do you get through this maze? Well, if you had a wall there, you'd bump into it, you'd have to turn around and go another way. Well, that's what we put at the end of this chapter. This is the one problem we actually had you can program that will, that will that you can actually do at the end of the chapter. So if you put up a wall, that means you are trapped. But if there is no wall, that means you can move straight through. And which way do you move? Well, you have to have a methodology to your 
playing. Now one of the methodologies is to look at and cling to a wall. And if you cling to a wall, let's say the, the left wall, if you're always clinging to that left wall, you will always find either your way out or you'll find your way back in to the input. And if you find your way back to the input, you know that there is no way out because you have explored all the possible paths. That's one way of doing it. It's not the most efficient way probably in that you can have a branching method that's like going out on the branches of a tree. And if you do it that way, which is the way that we propose doing it, that way you probably can get there a little faster. That said, you may not. So you're coming down through here and you're, you're going this way. And if that doesn't work, you're coming back and you're going this way. You're going to go this way. You're going to go this way. And you can see that if you cling to the wall, you're going to go along the wall and you're going to end up coming out this way anyway. Both good algorithms, but the tree branching approach probably is the better of the two. So you can have a weighting of each state. And you can say, if you want to go straight, you get so many percentage. If you go left, you get a percentage. If you go right, you get a percentage. You can give those fixed percentages, and that's one way of doing it. Doesn't necessarily mean it's the only way to do it, but it's one way of doing it. Okay. So if I wanted to be knowing that I was going to the right, maybe I would give it a higher percentage if I can go to the right as opposed to going to the left. In other words, if that's going to the east, then I always give a higher percentage to being able to go to the east because I know that that's putting me closer to the, uh, the output. So each node may be described by the following five components. Present state, past or current state or node, present action, cost of each path, depth into the tree. So this is a um, process. And like I said in chapter 15, uh, I had a treed approach to getting information out to the operator. You'd make a decision, make another decision, make another decision, make another decision. Basically that was just branching out branches on a tree. There was no uh, cost associated with anyone. As a matter of fact, the operator learned the methodology for getting there and they were much quicker at getting there than I was because I, even though I had written a program, I was not as quick as hitting those buttons as they were. They knew exactly how long it would take for the computer to register before they could hit the next button, hit the next button, hit the next button, and then be at their final destination where they would be asked the right question. So again, that's a tree structure as well, but not with any percentages or anything like that. You didn't have to worry, just basically you knew where you were going and you got there. So this is a project and uh, here's some more. And this one is kind of interesting in that these are puzzles and this is an arithmetic puzzle. And if you've ever seen one of these before, you would say, oh yeah, I've seen those. Those are not easy and they are not easy. Don't kid yourself. These programs are not easy at all, but what are they? Well, each of these letters stand for one particular number, zero through nine. And you can only, like if an M, an M has to be a one. So this would have to be a one as well up here. So you can start eliminating certain numbers. So the one and the one you can eliminate. Now, what are the rest of them? Well, you see an E here, an E here, and an E here. What is E? I don't know. But you can start with the puzzle, and you can start eliminating things, and then you can look at combinations, and you can say, well, uh, this N and this N are related because they're the same number. So what can you say about them? Well, I don't know, but you can write an equation perhaps and you can say this O and this O are something. And what is that? I don't know again. But there's only one unique number for O. There's only one unique number for E, for D, for Y, for S. And you can figure these out. They're not easy, but you can do it. 
you can write equations for those so okay and there's a lot of those puzzles there's a lot of them there's one that most of you have seen is the Rubik's Cube it's the same kind of puzzle that gets you back to a certain position here's another one the 8 puzzle how do you get back to this arrangement same thing as the Rubik's Cube only it's the same thing but different okay so you can branch this out and you can say from here I go to here from here I go to here from here I go to in other words you can keep branching until you find it um, so you can have these in a manufacturing plant as well and uh, you can see that there's different types of them the tree search and it can either go as two different ways depth first DFS or breadth first depth first means you go down all the way to the end with one so you take that one and, and go the whole length, the whole length that's depth first breadth first means you analyze the red you get all the red done and then you go down and you do all the blue and then once you get all the blue done you do the yellow that's breadth first which one would you like to do you have to choose you can't do them both obviously okay we're going to talk about another approach in a few minutes but basically you have two choices there graphical search problems graphical search problems basically are problems where you have weights of which way am I going to go and this looks like a state table doesn't it but basically it is a methodology where you go from here to one of these two from here to one of these three from here to one of these two you get the picture it's a it's a methodology for going from from circle to circle but how do you do it who determines how you do it AI can determine how you do it okay So here is one called iterative deepening. Iterative deepening. Depth first search, and you can write algorithms for doing a breadth first search. Uniform costs. And you can also use priority queuing. All right, so what are we talking about here? Well, here's some problems. Here's a problem for breadth first or depth first search. Find a method to evaluate a planar map with only four colors. The only criteria is that no two adjacent regions have the same color. Find if no solution exists. This problem requires backtracking as a search method. Here's another one: a three-foot-tall monkey with a four-foot with two the total of four-foot reach is in a room with bananas suspended at the nine foot from the floor. He can access two three foot tall crates. Describe how the monkey can access the bananas. Well, obviously he has to position the crates under the bananas, put them on top of each other and then climb to the top. That's obvious. Here's another one. There are three jugs in your garage of size 12 gallons, eight gallons and three gallons. You have access to a water faucet find a procedure to measure one gallon of water you may pour water from one jug to another or dump the water on the ground here's a good one and this is a process that I hope that while you may not ever go through and determine this exactly I hope that you do remember some of the ways that you can do this okay so here are three missionaries here are three cannibals here's a boat so the rule is I want to get these these guys over here with this boat and you have to have somebody in the boat every time you just can't send it on its way the boat has to be powered to go back and forth so that these three get over here without getting eaten now you say how does that happen it happens if at any time either on this side or on this side 
of the or in the in the middle you have an excess of cannibals you say well how would you ever do that is there only one way to do that I'm not going to solve it for you but I want to say this you can solve this and it looks like as in many cases with problems like this that if you ask the question from the back side in other words start over here and have various methodologies for one two and three people over here and then work your way back you'll get the answer much quicker than if you try to concentrate on it only from moving from left to right in other words your ultimate goal over here is to have three of these smiling puppies over here well maybe what if you had one or two smiling guys and you had one or two over here see what you can do and ask the question it's not a difficult question but it does take some thought so again this is a project you may or may not want to do it but what's my point my point is many problems like this many problems that you program in general work better if you look at them from the back to the front and from the front to the back than if you just look at them from the front to the back it works that way and many times you can solve your programming problem working from the back to the front and the front to the back as opposed to just concentrating on how am I going to start it works both ways here's another one those of you who like Cracker Barrel you've sat there many times I mentioned and done this and you wondered how does this ever work where you get down to one pen well maybe the best way to start would be starting with one pen and then adding a second pen and then a third pen and then a fourth pen and writing them down work from the back to the front and then you'll probably be able to work from the front to the back as well and maybe in one setting you can have a solution I don't know but at least it's possible are these unique no they're not unique there's more than one way to solve these mm -hmm. but your solution may very well be found easier if you work from the back to the front it works that way and I I can just say I haven't sat and done this but I know that this way works just as just as well as with the, with the missionary problem and it works in many programming problems the same way okay so what does the word heuristic mean it means we know something we got a memory it means that we don't come to this blind and we know a little bit before we ever get started so heuristic means we've got a we've got a back we've got a backlog of information and you use that so you use your searching techniques with a pre-existing knowledge base that's what heuristic means and you've got some games here that can make you want to play or not play tic-tac-toe or whatever and I just let you figure that out as well so how do you really write AI where did AI come from well it's come and it's evolved through the years but basically it comes from Bayes formula if I come to a point and I look at something and I say which way should I go I go left or right up or down three if I have three positions which of the three do I take it's based on what has happened in the past it's based on base formula and we're going to go down here and we'll look at base formula in a minute and that's basically what we need to, to look at okay so as you add more capabilities to your model if you're going to model something and you're going to say which is the best way to choose you're going to say based on the knowledge that you have this is the best way to go okay what does this say probability of a given b is the probability of a and b over the probability of b Bayes formula simple but yet very profound 
Okay, and you're always going to go the way that more than 50% or the way that is the most likely way. So this makes sense. This is what Bayes' formula is about. And if you have to model something, in other words, when we were in that maze before and you had a heuristic, in other words, you had a knowledge of what had been done before, even though they might have moved a wall or two, if you had a knowledge of some of the walls, maybe what you'd have done is you would have predicted at each stage what would have been the probability at that point from what you've done in the past. So you can use heuristics as part of your, your game plan. Okay. Those are conditional probabilities and we're going to go through this. These are this is what you've had in statistics before. All right. Uh, these are, uh, again, more probability statistics. So here again, we come into an event and we decide which way we're going to go based on what? The probability that we're going to be successful. And that depends on heuristics. So this is how a simple Bayes network would work. And then you can start evaluating it. Would you do this in a program controller or would you do this in another computer? Good question. Probably you'd do it in another computer and then let the this is where you're going to Watson. This is the this is the Watson part of it. But you might do this in your program controller. I doubt if you would sit down and write all this out in your program controller, but you could. You can also, like I said, go to Watson, which is going to the higher level computer and then coming back to make you feed it all this information and then it sits there and crunches that information and it'll decide which way you should go. Okay. Now we have these other systems that have been around for quite a while and and if you were to look back at the 1990s the everybody was thinking in terms of uh, expert systems and they were thinking of neural networks. So for a while neural networks held sway, but as we've gotten further along, we have basically said, nah, we're going to use Bayes' formula. But here there is a synopsis of what it takes to do a neural network, okay? So we have all these inputs and they go into these receptors, excuse me, these guys, and then they get modeled and then there's an output. Now the key here is this is all using um, the, uh, some of the squares least, least error fits. So we run all of our inputs through multiple ones of these summation devices with multipliers. We find what these multipliers are and you can also have multiple rows of these multipliers and at the end of the day you find out what all these B's are and then you find the best fits and that gives you a best fit path through this maze so, what is it about this? Is this something that you would use today? It looks very complicated, and it is. You could use this today. It is a modeling technique. It has really not done well over the last 20 years. It, for a while, it was thought that it was going to go strong, but neural networks today really aren't what most people fall back on. They're more interested in the AI portion, and the AI portion follows the Bayes formula. So this 
is not quite as robust a system as is Bayes. And why is that? Because Bayes is constantly adjusting these terms. This one is fixed. Once you bring this formula in, it's fixed until you bring it in again. And then you, you basically go back and you adjust and you go back and you adjust and you go back and you adjust. So these are not constantly getting repainted. They're fixed until you bring your formula back in again. Now, what you have to do with this is you have to set this up. If you did use this in a computer, you would have to set this up and you have two models. You have the one you're running on, which is the old set of these Bs, and you have the new one, which you're not running on, but you're collecting data so that you can reevaluate and redo these Bs. So what happens if you get off the reservation, if you get up here or down here someplace? What happens? This may not be able to handle it. That's why this one falls apart quicker, because if you get off into the mush, one side or the other, this one does this one falls apart it doesn't know what to do it's not as robust if you get out of the area that you've studied before that's why this is not as quite as good as using Bayes. where do we, where would you use this well at the end of this chapter there's some um, tutorials that are youtube tutorials and you'd use this on things like um, well, for one thing is voice recognition, another is uh, writing rec recognition. You'd use this for something like that, and most of the time it works very, 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 very well for that. So the, the writing recognition one is a very good tutorial, and I think that it's something that if you're more interested in neural networks, you can see how these Bs can be adjusted so that you can, from a scribble, recognize whether it's an eight or seven or a six or five or whatever, you can see the methodology for these Bs actually zeroing in on a digit and, and basically analyzing your, your, uh, your uh, scribbles, your, uh, your, um, your writing. And uh, that's one way that it's done. And it's very quick and it's very, very effective. So these Bs are linear and uh, they, they are usually linear and uh, they, they're very, uh, they're very, there's a good example and this was from MathWorks and uh, gives you a little bit of an idea how you can um, use this technique. So here is the neural network that we're using and this reference one is the one that the data is being collected on for right now. In other words, this is the one that we're building for you later use, and we're going to plop it down into here when we feel like we need to. But this one up here is our, um, we're just collecting, we're, we're looking in, we're collecting, and this is the one you're actually running with. Are these used very much in, in plant? Uh, I've never used one, and I don't know where they're being used, but I imagine they are. And I would imagine that they're being used in some cases quite a lot. This is not what they use, though, usually when they say we're going to Watson. It's the other guy. It's the, the Bayes. This other thing called fuzzy logic is a technique for smoothing things out and making things more appropriate for what they really are. And, and, and that's something that you can do with the present language that we've got. Fuzzy logic is nothing more than making true and false statements, binary statements, into something that is really an analog system. So, in other words, if you were to say, I want to do this on the week or on the weekend, what are you saying? Well, if you were to make it a binary, two, two, two state, Thursday and Friday would be zeros, Saturday and Sunday would be ones, and Monday would be a uh, zero again. But you know that's not the case. Here's somebody who's kind of a, you know, really anticipating that fun uh, getting out of out of dodge, getting out of dodge. So Thursday he's planning his weekend. Friday he's really living his weekend. Saturday he is in the weekend, and Sunday he's starting to bend back into the into the grind of the week. So again, this is a way of making an analog value out of a, out of a digital value. That's what it is. And you can program with these. You can actually program with a 
method we would call some kind of a curve as opposed to squared off like this. So if that makes sense, that's exactly what it is. Fuzzy. It's not really fuzzy. It analog it analyzes things in an analog way that are really digital values. And you can use these with the ands and ors. So I can take the and of this with something else and I say if it's going to be an on, if it's over 50%, if it's less than 50%, it's going to be a zero. That's how you play the game. It's it's a real, it's just the same as digital but with analog values. And you say, could I write this with using greater than and less than? And the answer is absolutely yes, you could. It's, it's not hard to do it with slopes and and, and uh, analog values, but you would have to you have to write them in an, in an orderly way. Fuzzy Logix takes that into account. So some people like it, some people don't. I'll just say this. Um, it's not been as accepted in the United States by most people as in the rest of the world. And if you were to say that you are a fuzzy expert, fuzzy logic expert, you probably would get looked at in the United States at least a little askance. So my advice to you is to not play this up and not say that you're an expert in physics logic because it's probably not something that most people would be interested in paying you much for here. But that said, here's, a, here's some examples of it. And uh, they do have fuzzy logic in some of these PLCs. So you can actually get a fuzzy logic language set for some of these um, for some of the PLCs. I don't know if these, I don't think the regular Allen Bradley and the regular Siemens that we have does have it, but I've seen them. There are fuzzy logic controllers. Here is MATLAB's version of fuzzy logic and just bring it to your attention as a reference. Okay, this is about 10 years old. So this is a um, introduction to artificial intelligence and we basically have talked through a number of different uh, terms and hopefully it will spur you on to at least getting interested in AI and getting a uh, starting, uh, getting a foothold in that area if that's what if if you do run into it. So again, I'm not uh, holding you to working each of these problems or any of this sort of thing. You've done that in statistics already, but I do know that it's something that you could do. Uh, very few people have actually written this program and gotten it working. I will say this: uh, I always held it out as. Um, is a real good problem and if you want to do it you certainly can it's not it's not impossible to do it's been done these are these neural network um, references and this one right here is the one that I talked about that is the the one that finds the letter uh, from a written uh, a uh, vision system that that, that takes uh, a matrix of uh, darks and lights and converts it into a number. So this is explaining how that's done. These go a little bit deeper. You certainly can get an idea about neural networks from these, these chapters. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea on artificial intelligence. Take care.